Hi, it's Liz from G Mum's Place again, and today I'm talking about John Grisham's The Activist, which is number four in the Theodore Boone series, published in 2013. On the front of John Grisham's book, it says, You don't need to have superpowers to be a hero. Here's the synopsis How about it, Theo? Sebastian said. They've already tried to kill your dog. Theodore Boone's town is under threat from a group of corrupt men planning to build a freeway bypass and destroy countless homes. Now 13-year-old Theo, the schoolboy lawyer destined for the courtroom, must stand up for his city and stop them. But soon the fight turns nasty and Theo and his friends face a giant battle against the underhand crooks. And when Theodore uncovers a terrible secret, a secret he's discovered illegally, he is torn. Should Theo stop the shady developers from breaking the law by breaking it himself? It's a big dilemma for Theo. And here are the opening paragraphs. The opponent was the team from Central, the other school in town, and the great rival of Strattenburg Middle School. Whenever there was a game or a match or contest of any sort against Central, the tensions were higher, the crowds were bigger, and things just seemed more important. This was true even for a debate. One month earlier, the SMS 8th grade debate team had won at Central in a packed auditorium, and when the decision was announced by the judges, the crowd was not happy. There were a few boos, though these were quickly hushed. Good behaviour and sportsmanship were expected, regardless of the contest. Strattenberg's captain was Theodore Boone, who was also the anchor, closer, the go-to guy when the pressure was on. Theo and his team had never lost, though they were not quite undefeated. Two months earlier, they had tied with the SMS girls team after a rowdy debate on the issue of raising the driving age from 16 to 18. But Theo wasn't thinking about other debates at the moment. He was on stage, seated at a folding table, Aaron on one side and Joey on the other, all three young men in coats and ties and looking quite snappy, and all three staring across the stage at the team from Central. Mr Mount, Theo's advisor, friend and debate coach, was speaking into the microphone and saying, and now the final statement by Strattenberg from Theodore Boone. Theo glanced at the crowd. His father was sitting in the front row. His mother, a busy divorce lawyer, was tied up in court and upset that she was missing her only child in action. Behind Mr Boone was a row of girls, including April Finnamore, one of Theo's closest friends, and Hallie Kershaw, the most popular girl in the entire eighth grade. Grouped behind the girls were a bunch of teachers. Madame Monique from Cameroon, who taught Spanish and was Theo's second favourite, after Mr Mount, of course, and Mrs Garman, who taught geometry, and Mrs Everly, who taught English. Even Mrs Gladwell, the principal, was there. All in all, a nice crowd for a debate, anyway. For a basketball or football game, there would have been twice as many spectators, but then those teams had more than three contestants per side, and frankly were more exciting to watch. Theo tried not to consider these things, though it was difficult. An asthma condition prohibited him from participating in organised sports, so this was his chance to compete before spectators. He loved the fact that most of his classmates were terrified of speaking in public, while he enjoyed the challenge. Justin could dribble a basketball between his legs and hit three-pointers all day long, but when called on in class, he was as timid as a four-year-old. Brian was the fastest 13-year-old swimmer in Strattenburg, and he enjoyed the confident swagger of a great athlete, but put him in front of a crowd and he wilted. Not Theo. Theo spent little time in the bleachers cheering for the other kids. Instead, he hung around courtrooms and watched lawyers battle before juries and judges. He would be a great lawyer one day, and though he was only 13, he had already learned the valuable lesson that speaking in public was important to success. It wasn't easy. In fact, as Theo stood and walked businesslike to the podium, he felt his stomach flip and his heart race. He had read stories of great athletes and their pre-game routines, and how many of them were so tense and edgy they would actually vomit. Theo did not feel sick to his stomach, but he felt the fear, the unease 
veteran trial lawyer had once told him, if you're not nervous, son, then something is wrong. Theo was certainly nervous, but he knew from experience it was only temporary. Once the game started, the butterflies disappeared. He touched the microphone, looked at the moderator and said, thank you, Mr. Mount. He turned to the central team, cleared his throat, reminded himself once again to speak clearly and slowly and began. Now, Mr. Bledsoe makes some valid points especially when he argues that someone who breaks the law should not benefit from it, and that many American students who were born here and whose parents were born here cannot afford college. These arguments cannot be ignored. Theo took a breath, then turned his attention to the spectators, though he avoided eye contact. He had learned a few tricks during his career in debate, and one of the most important was to ignore the faces in the crowd. They could be distracting. They could make you lose your train of thought. Instead, Theo looked at objects when he spoke. An empty seat on the right side, a clock in the back of the room, a window on the left side. And as he spoke, he continually shifted his gaze from one to the other. This gave the clear impression that Theo was tuned in to the crowd, looking earnestly, communicating. It made him seem comfortable at the podium, something the judges always liked. He continued, However, children of undocumented workers, we used to call them illegal immigrants, have no choice where they are born, nor can they choose where they live. Their parents made the decision to enter, illegally, the United States, and they did so primarily because they were hungry and looking for a job. It's not fair to punish the children for what the parents did. We have students in this school and at Central and at every school in this district who are not supposed to be here because their parents broke the law, but we admit them, we accept them, and our system educates them. In many cases, they are our friends. The issue was red hot. There was a noisy movement sweeping across the state to prohibit the children of undocumented workers from enrolling in public colleges. Those who supported the ban argued that the large number of illegals would, one, swamp the university system, and two, squeeze out American students who might otherwise barely qualify for college, and three, consume millions in tax dollars paid in by real US citizens. The central team had done a good job making these points so far in the debate. Theo went on, the law requires this school system and every school system in this state to accept and educate all students, regardless of where they come from. If the state has to pay the for the first 12 years, why then should the state be allowed to slam the doors when these students are ready for college? Theo had some notes scribbled on a sheet of paper in front of him on the podium, but he refused to look down. Judges loved debaters who spoke without looking down, and Theo knew he was earning points. All three of the boys from Central had relied on their notes. He raised a finger and said, first, it's a question of fairness. All of us have been told by our parents that they expect us to go to college. It's part of the American dream. It seems unfair then to pass a law that will prohibit many of our students and many of our friends from being admitted to college. He raised another finger. Second, competition is always good. Mr. Bledsoe takes the position that US citizens should be given priority in college admissions because their parents were here first, even though some of these students and not as qualified as the children of undocumented workers. Shouldn't our colleges admit the best students, period? Across this state each year, there are about 30,000 openings for incoming freshmen. Why should anyone get special consideration? If our colleges admit the best students, doesn't that make our colleges stronger? Of course it does. No one should be admitted unless he or she deserves it, just as no one should be denied based on where his or her parents were born. Mr. Mount worked hard to suppress a grin. Theo was on a roll and he knew it. He managed to add just a trace of anger to his voice. Nothing too dramatic, but the right touch that conveyed the message. This is so obvious. How can anyone argue with me? Mr. Mount had seen this before. Theo was moving in for the kill. The third finger was thrust into the air. As Theo said, the final point is this. He paused and took a breath and looked around the auditorium as though his final point, whatever it might be, was going to be so true and so clear that no one in the room could have any doubt. There are many studies proving that people with college degrees have more opportunities better jobs and higher salaries than people without college degrees. It's a head start to a better life, and higher salaries means higher tax revenues. 
which leads to better schools and better colleges. People who are denied the chance to go to college are more likely to become unemployed and that leads to all sorts of problems. Theo paused again and slowly checked the top button of his jacket. He knew the button was okay, but he needed to convey the image of utmost confidence. In closing, this notion of slamming the doors of our colleges to students whose parents came here illegally is a bad idea. It's been rejected by over 20 states already. That's why the Justice Department in Washington has promised to file a lawsuit in this state if such a law is passed. It is short-sighted, mean-spirited and simply not fair. This is the land of opportunity and at one time or another all of our ancestors came here as immigrants. We are a nation of immigrants. Thank you. Mr. Mount appeared at the edge of the stage as Theo returned to his seat. Mr. Mount smiled and said, let's have a nice round of applause for both teams. The audience, which had been warned against expressing support or opposition in any way, offered a warm round of applause. Let's take a short break, Mr. Mount said. Theo, Aaron and Joey quickly stood and walked across the stage where they shook hands with the central team. All six boys were relieved. The pressure was finally off. Theo nodded to his father, who gave him a thumbs up. Great job. Minutes later, the judges announced the winner, and obviously Theo's team won. Each book in this series has been better than the last. The story's more intense, the threats to their way of life worse. There is a scout camping trip in this book too. The animal court case is against four men who hurt Theo's dog, and Theo's performance in court was excellent. The characters are extremely well crafted, and I have given five stars on Goodreads to all that I have read so far. I'm looking forward to the next one. As always, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell, smash the like button, and say hi in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching this video.